There are many parameters that chassis engineers need to worry about when designing a new suspension system. Camber, caster, toe are some of the more obvious ones, but there are others like scrub radius, caster trail, kingpin angle, and many more. Today, however, I would like to talk about anti-dive and anti-lift. In a previous video, I described anti-squat and how that works, and in particular, the mistake many people make when calculating it. If you haven't seen that video, you can watch it here. Hello, everyone. I'm Hubert Mace, and this is Suspensions Explained. Many of the concepts I described in my anti-squat video are true for anti-dive and anti-lift as well, but while anti-squat is a property of rear suspensions during acceleration, anti-dive and anti-lift are properties of front and rear suspensions respectively and are relevant during braking. We're going to talk today about what these are, how they work, how to calculate the math associated with them, and finally, what they actually do for us in a car and how we can use them to our advantage. I'm sure you've all experienced that when you hit the brakes in a car, the car pitches forward. The harder you press on the brake pedal, the more the car will pitch. What is happening here is that during braking, weight is being transferred forward in the car. Weight isn't actually moving forward, but the force of braking causes a moment to be applied to the car that pushes down on the front and lifts up on the rear. This is because the braking force being applied to the car is located at the contact patch between the tires and the ground, and the center of gravity of the car is some distance above it. This means the force trying to slow the car down isn't being applied directly to it, but offset at some distance. This distance, called the CG height, times the braking force becomes a moment trying to rotate the car inside you. This rotation is resisted by the front and the rear tires, but because the moment is pushing down on the front and pulling up on the rear, it causes the springs to deflect and the car to pitch. The amount depends on the size of the moment, which depends on the braking force, how high the center of gravity is above ground, and how far apart the front and the rear wheels are from each other, i.e. the wheelbase. Let's look at an example. We'll assume a car that is 2,000 kilograms, has a center of gravity that is 500 millimeters above ground, and a wheelbase of 2,800 millimeters. If we assume a 0.5 g stop, we will get 2,000 times 9.8 times 0.5 equals 9,800 newtons of braking force. Since the height of the CG is 0.5 meters, the moment will be 9,800 newtons times 0.5 meters equals 4,900 newton meters. With a wheelbase of 2,800 millimeters or 2.8 meters, the force pushing down on the front wheels will be 4,900 divided by 2.8 equals 1,750 newtons. This is also the force pulling up on the rear wheels. For the engineers who are watching, and remember their statics, you can derive the same math by summing moments about the front tire contact patch. If we now make a few more assumptions about a car, such as a weight distribution of 55% on the front, a front ride frequency of 1.2 Hz, and a rear ride frequency of 1.3 Hz, then we can calculate how much deflection we will get in the front and rear springs. If we do that, we end up with about 31 millimeters of deflection in the front suspension and about 34 millimeters in the rear, meaning we would expect the front to go down about 31 millimeters and the rear to rise up 34 millimeters. But that assumes the front and rear suspensions do deflect directly according to the spring rates. But just as we were able to control the deflection of the rear suspension during acceleration with anti-squat, we can do something similar to both the front and rear suspensions during braking with anti-dive and anti-lift. Let's look at each one separately. We'll start with anti-dive. Anti-dive is a property of front suspensions that uses some of the braking force to counteract the effect of weight transfer. We can use some of the braking force to push back up against the downward push of the weight transfer. Here's how we do that. For suspensions that don't have inboard brakes, which is pretty much every suspension out there today, braking forces act on the suspension at the tire contact patch. So we need to look at what the suspension is doing at the contact patch. If you watched my anti-squat video, remember how we modeled the suspension as if it were a pin in a slot? Well, we need to do the same thing here, but instead of looking at the wheel center, we look at the contact patch. 
This takes a bit of imagination because there is no part of the suspension that reaches down to the contact patch. What we have to do is imagine the suspension moving up and down with the brakes locked. So the tire and the knuckle are instantaneously solidly connected to each other. What motion does the contact patch make when you move the suspension up and down slightly? By looking at the instantaneous motion of the contact patch, what we are doing here is finding the instantaneous center of rotation of the knuckle. A line from that point to the contact patch tells us how much anti-dive we have when compared with an ideal line, which we'll talk about later. But first we need to find that line, and just like with anti-squat, there are two methods we can use. The meh method and the correct method. The first is the one you may have seen in other videos and books on suspension design, and it is a geometric method. That's the meh method. In the geometric method, what we do is draw lines through the upper and lower arms to see where these lines intersect, and then draw a line from there to the contact patch. Let's look at an example. Here we have a model of a simple upper and lower wishbone suspension. The upper arm is shown in yellow, the lower arm is in red, and the tie rod in blue. If we move the suspension up and down, you can see how it moves as you would expect. The first thing we need to do is draw lines through the inner bushings of each control arm, like this. Then we need to look in side view. If we fade out the tire, you can see how the lines go through the bushings of each arm. Next, we draw a line from where these two lines intersect down to the tire contact patch. You'll notice that the contact patch looks like it's inside the tire. That's because this model shows an undeflected tire. In reality, the weight of the car will slightly deflect the tire. This is the line we are interested in, and this completes the geometric method. The other method for finding the instant center is to look at the instantaneous motion of the contact patch as the suspension moves up and down. This is really the preferred method, but it does require some sort of computer model. The way this works is by locking the brakes so that the wheel and the knuckle act as a single unit, and then moving the suspension up and down a small amount. In the model, I'll move the suspension up 10 millimeters and mark where the contact patch is. Then I'll move it down 10 millimeters and mark where that contact patch is. If I then draw a line through these two points, and then draw a line perpendicular to that through the undeflected contact patch, we will then have a line along which the instant center must lie. It really doesn't matter where along this line the instant center is, because we are really only interested in the line itself. That's the end of the instantaneous radius method. Let's now see how the results of the two methods compare. We see that they are actually very different. This is because the geometric method tries to solve a three-dimensional problem with a two-dimensional solution, and it doesn't always work that well. This is why I prefer to use the instantaneous radius method, and why the models manufacturers use to design suspensions use it as well. Okay, now that we have the line we need, how do we use it to determine how much anti-dive we have? For this, we need to know a bit more about our car. In particular, we need to know the percent braking done by the front brakes versus the rear. We need to know the brake split. In many cases, this will be a number around 60 or 70 percent, but it really depends on the weight distribution. For a car like a front-engined, front-wheel drive sedan, the number will be closer to 70 percent. These cars have a lot of their weight on the front wheels, and so the front brakes need to do a lot more of the work. For a car like a Porsche 911 that has the engine in the rear, the number will be much lower. Once we know the brake split, we can draw the ideal anti-dive line. We do this by first drawing a horizontal line through the center of gravity of the car. Next, we mark a point along this line a distance behind the front wheels equal to the wheelbase times the front brake percentage. From that point, we draw a line to the front contact patch. This is our ideal anti-dive line. Let's go back to our example car and go through it. Let's assume the brake split in our car is 65% meaning that the front brakes do 65% of the total braking work. We draw a horizontal line through the center of gravity, which is 500 millimeters above ground. Next, we mark off a distance equal to our wheelbase, which is 2,800 millimeters, multiplied by the front brake split, which is 65%. 2,800 times 65% is 1,820 millimeters. From there, we draw a line to the front contact patch. This is the ideal anti-dive line. 
What the ideal line means is that if the line we got from our suspension analysis falls directly on this line, then we have 100% anti-dive. And that means that the braking force would counteract 100% of the weight transfer force and there would be no dive in the suspension at all. The last thing we need to do is compare the line we got from our suspension analysis with this ideal line to see how much anti-dive we really have. The way we do that is to look at the angles between each line and horizontal. In the case of our suspension, we see that the angle is 6 degrees. If we now look at the ideal line, we see that its angle is 15.4 degrees. 6 is 39% of 15.4, so what we have here is 39% anti-dive. That means that the braking force will counteract 39% of the weight transfer force, and we should expect to get 39% less dive in the front suspension during braking. In our example car, if we expected 31 millimeters of dive in a 0.5 G stop, then with this suspension design, we would only get 19 millimeters. Comparing this to the line we got from the geometric method, we see that its angle is 8 degrees. 8 is 52% of 15.4. So we see how the two methods would give us very different answers, and how important it is to use the right method. Now that we know how anti-dive works, let's look at anti-lift. Anti-lift works exactly the same way as anti-dive, except everything is in the reverse direction. We still want to find out the angle of the contact patch motion, and we find it in the same ways. We can use the geometric method here as well, although in many cases it becomes harder since there are so many different rear suspension designs out there, or we can use the instantaneous radius method, which will give us the right answer. Again, we'll move the suspension up and down a small amount, track where the contact patch is, draw a line through those points, we'll again draw a line perpendicular through the undeflected contact patch, and if everything is good, we would expect this line to face forward, just like it did with anti-squat. The ideal anti-lift line is drawn very similar to the anti-dive line. We use the exact same point we created before, except that now we draw a line from there to the rear contact patch. Now that we know what anti-dive and anti-lift are, and how to calculate them, we need to talk about why we even care about them. Why do suspension engineers even worry? To answer this question, let's look at what happens when we hit the brakes in a car. As the braking force builds, the moment created by the braking force acting through the center of gravity height causes the body to pitch forward. And as the body pitches, so do all the passengers inside. And since the passengers sit much higher than the center of gravity, they are pitched forward slightly. So as the car starts to slow down, there is a small delay between the time the car actually slows down and the time the passengers slow down due to this pitching motion. This isn't normally a problem, but the driver knows when he or she stepped on the brake pedal and can feel when they perceive the car slowing down. Even a microsecond difference between these two events can cause a moment of panic or uncertainty that the car isn't slowing down like it should. If we could use anti-dive and anti-lift to reduce the amount of pitching, then we would also reduce the time delay between the car slowing down and the passengers perceiving it to be slowing down. But what if we could take this a step further? What if we allowed the front suspension to dive down by designing for only a small amount of anti-dive, but kept the rear from lifting by adding lots of anti-lift in the rear? There would still be some pitch, but since the rear would be staying relatively still, the pitch would be in a downward direction. The passengers, and more importantly the driver, would actually be pulled down slightly. I've driven cars like this in the past, and the feeling is that the car is being sucked down to the ground during braking. It's a great feeling, and it gives the driver a lot of confidence that the brakes are working well, even if the car isn't actually slowing down any faster. Unfortunately, designing lots of anti-lift into a rear suspension is difficult, and can compromise other important characteristics such as handling and comfort, especially when the car is used under different loading conditions. In my experience, the anti-dive and anti-lift values that work well and help the car feel confident under braking are 20-25% to anti-dive in the front and 50-70% to anti-lift in the rear. These numbers will usually ensure that the driver will drop slightly during braking and they are very achievable with most modern suspension designs. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please subscribe and hit the notifications button and we'll see you next time for more Suspensions Explained.